Okay, <coughs> so we're right on time, 3 o'clock, and let's start with our normal protocol, our standard protocol of 30 seconds of quiet time so we can deal with any fellowship issues we have. <coughs> if we're still in perfect fellowship, we can use that time to petition for understanding uh, from the Holy Spirit and His truth, and at the end of that 30 seconds, I'll start the class. Let's start now. Dear gracious Heavenly Father, Lord, I pray for your blessing on this time that we're in your word. Help us to just set everything aside for the time being to be with you, to be uh, with your word, to be with your Holy Spirit, who is the true teacher of the word of God. I pray, Lord, help us to understand these doctrines that are so critical to the way in which we conduct ourselves, the way in which we think, the way in which we approach everything that's, uh, that's in our Christian life. I ask this in Jesus' holy name. Amen. <clears throat> so today is Sunday, March the 20th, 2022. Today is the first day of spring, and it's the vernal equinox, which means that spring is the vernal part. Equinox means the day actually meets, uh, it's exactly 12 hours and 12 hours uh, of sunlight and darkness. And uh, there's actually a piece in here that actually happened if you're, in the, if you're on the West Coast. That happened at 7.33 a.m. this morning. We are, the equator of the sun actually matched the equator of the, of the earth. Um, so that's, that's kind of unusual, but that's kind of fun. But it is kind of an interesting thing. I thought about this as part of where we're at, is that a lot that's going on in the world today <coughs> looks really awful. And what I see from this is that we had frost this morning <laughs> when we woke up. A little bit of snow, actually, where we're at. Uh, but what is interesting about that is that uh, that snow cannot persist because of the fact it is the, it is the vernal equinox, which means that every day will get warmer. And this is just like God's plan. Even though you can have some evil at the time, that evil cannot overtake God's plan. Just like in reality... <clears throat> that whatever storm is going on this time of year, when it, as it moves through the time, at that perfect time, in reality, that storm has no power. It has no ability to it. It can't overcome the coming summer. Okay? And that's exactly how it is. So there's a system built in by God that is immovable, just like it is in our times today. You know, although we see Satan trying to do things, we see this stuff like a big storm and we're scared of it. Many Christians are scared of it. Um, tragically true. <clears throat> and what happens is they don't understand that it's just like this model here, is that God has a plan and he allows things to happen in that plan <clears throat> to actually become part of his good. But we don't see them. What happens is when you don't have Bible doctrine to lean on, what, what happens is you become afraid. You start thinking, oh, the rapture's coming. And, and that would really be wonderful. I'd really like that. Actually, I'd like it happen before the class so the Lord can finish this class. But in reality, what happens is that we become fearful when we look at these storms, never understanding that it's just like this model, is that the model is that the, the, what God has instituted is so infinitely more powerful that in reality, the storm we see today has no power on, this, on the plan of God. None. Okay? It will not prevail. <clears throat> now, it may change things, and it may look ugly, but in reality, it doesn't have the ability to overcome it, okay? Um, and this is really like Romans 8.28. And I brought this to this one because we're in this piece right here where this really horrible thing is happening, okay? Potentially um, something in, from a doctrinal point of view that could really mess up the church, okay? That's what Galatians is. Galatians is the church. It, 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 is, the, it is written to and it actually shows us how, if you've, if you've listened to this piece, you can see how legalism and the law are trying to creep in and overcome uh, Christian doctrine, 
in reality. And that doctrine is one of freedom, and that one is one of peace, and that one is one of truth, and that is one of power. Legalism of, of the old system, which is the law, is trying to overcome it. But what happens here, Paul steps in with the power of God, puts this thing whole in there, puts it in perspective, and by doing this, by this evil coming upon it, by the Judaizers, it gives Paul and the Lord a chance to crystallize this for us as believers. So in the same way, it's Romans 8.28. In reality, we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him. Operative word, not for good of everybody, but for the good of those who love him. Okay, And we're in that same thing. We have that storm today in our society that's absolutely a train wreck. We have a war. We have, we have all kinds of things. <clears throat> but in reality, they do not prevail against God's purpose. And God will use that, use what we see in the society we're in, to his greater purpose, that is the part of the design of God. And we as Christians are alive, should be excited, that's right, excited, that we have the opportunity to be part of that and glorify Christ by having the light of Christ and the character of Christ in us. Okay? So that's your Christian side. Let's get back to the story. But in reality, they have a lot. We have this happening a lot where these, this evil overcomes the world and this evil tries to infiltrate into the churches. In reality, it, that, that evil comes up with the, with the point that Satan wants to, wants to cripple the church, which he's done a fairly good job at right now. But in reality, behind that, God uses that very evil and turns it to a greater good. And we are in that same time, and so we should remember those kind of things in this time. It is our faith in the Word and our faith in the Lord. So let's get on with our study um, so we can kind of see how this, <clears throat> but if you follow this whole thing, we're, this actually may be, end up being two lessons by the time we're done with it. It may take us this Sunday and next Sunday to finish it. I don't know yet uh, because some of the doctrines uh, in, in this piece are profound. They're just profound pieces. And I'm going to say some things today that I hope that I can clarify them, to, that it'll, it'll kind of scare you, but actually it has a profound um, purpose, okay? Um, so we're, gonna, we're still in the Antioch incident. We should be finishing it today, but maybe not. And I, get, I put this quote in here to help you understand it. And it says, Run, John, run. And this was written by uh, John Bunyan in 1628. Not 16, but he was born in 1628. Died in 1688. But he put this in here. And it says the law, and it has continued. But I'm going to read it to you, but you can find it out. You can just put Run John Run, the law, and it'll actually pop this up in Google, the yeah, evil empire Google. <laughs> um, it's just a tool. <laughs> um, that will actually tell you what it means, but it's one of the greatest quotes. If you don't know who John Bunyan is, he is, a, he is the writer of the book of Pilgrim's Progress. Probably the finest allegory, allegory is kind of like a picture you paint for people to understand bigger things, <clears throat> and, but it's an allegory he writes called Pilgrim's Progress. It is the best allegory of Christianity, and it was written in the 1600s. Okay, 1600s. What does that tell us? It tells us that those men back 400 years ago, 350, 380, were actually really understood Christianity. It's not new. We did not do something wonderful this time. Many of the greatest Christians who ever lived, lived back in those times, lived way before ours. They understood Christianity better than we understand it today. Okay, so let me, let me give you John's quote here. It says, run, John, run. The law commands, this is part of our story, but gives us neither feet nor hands. Far better news the gospel brings. It bids us fly and gives us wings. That's the really, if, if you can find this quote, you can look at it. It tells us the difference between these two. And I'll tell you what the thing, run John, run is a command. And he says here, and the Lord, that the law commands it. The Mosaic law commands, run, John, run. Meaning John, the person who wrote it. Run, Richard, run. It's commanding us to do that. And it says, it commands us to do something, but it gives us neither feet nor hands to achieve it. 
Okay? That's what's the problem with the law. That's always been the problem with the law. Now, he brings up the other part. But the gospel, the good news of salvation, which is the context of where we're at, it bids us, note the word bids us. It doesn't command us. It bids us. It asks us. It gives us an entreaty. That's what the word's called. It's an entreaty. Fly. But in that, in that request, it provides us wings to do it. That's the difference between grace and the law. Okay? The law gives us the ability. Now, we might come back to this, but watch that because that's what shows up in these verses. And what the law tells us to do, in reality, it cannot help us with. It actually condemns us. Okay? So let's get to it. And here's the uh, first verse, verse 16. And uh, I'm going <clears> to, <throat> I'll read it from here and then we'll go and kind of dissect it. He says, nevertheless, nevertheless is always the part where it says, given what I've said before, this is true. So he's moving forward. And this right here is, there's two things to understand about it. He starts a quotation mark right here. Now he's given the principle in here, and he's also given us a principle in 20, which by the way is my wife's very most favorite verse. This is the one she loves and always tells me about. Whenever this, she just bubbles up with this, and it's a favorite verse of many people because it is a principle that has more doctrine. In reality, we could dissect this verse and spend a class on it with no trouble at all. Okay? Um, so we have two principles here, and then we have actually what takes place in here. Okay? Same thing underneath it. So the principle that we have here uh, is a principle stated first, and then it actually gives us examples, and then states that another principle, and then gives us a, an example. The, the important part about this, and this is what nobody tells you to do, that this is a Jewish viewpoint. If you don't, if you take it from a Christian viewpoint, you will be confused. Okay? It's a Jewish viewpoint that's being put here, if you don't understand it. So if you, if you don't fill in these little pieces, you don't know who's talking, and you don't know why they say what they say, and you don't know what it means. So you have to look at it. So there's a, Christ, there's a Jewish viewpoint that is being stated by Paul in this principle to help understand. Now one of the problems is, as, as, as Christians, the Gentile viewpoint, which I have down here, you probably can't see it, but it says, the problem is that Gentiles aren't confused. Okay? We're not confused. As Gentiles, we're not confused. It, <clears throat> the Galatians, when they first got the gospel message, under, when they said, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you shall be saved, and they went, I believe, and they were saved, just like that. Boom. That's, that's the entire piece of the this, of this scripture. They didn't get confused until these moronic Jewish believers came back and gave them the viewpoint of the Mosaic Law, and that messed them up. That's what the whole book of Galatians is about. It's about these morons, and I'll call them morons because they are, uh, making these people, the Galatians, who are Gentiles, also morons. Okay? They, they actually messed them up. And remember, through this entire thing, where we start the quotation marks, I put them up here. This is all a quotation. Okay? What does that mean? That means it's a public sermon. It's a public sermon given by Paul in the church of Antioch, addressed to the Jewish believers specifically. He's chewing them out along with Paul and a little bit of Barnabas and a little bit of the Jewish believers that we talked about last week. He's chewing them out. Okay? He was telling them, uh, well, we'll read what he tells them, okay? But it's a public sermon. He is insulting them in front of everybody. And what's supposed to happen is that the, in the church of Antioch, uh, in, that's why he's using this, because the people in Antioch were Jews, were Gentiles too, is that he's using this to insult them, to help them understand um, from, a, from their Jewish point of view how they got messed up and how the law does not work. That's right. The law does not work. Okay? And, and hopefully you'll understand why. So we have the principle here. It says, nevertheless, knowing, and this is a very specific, I underlined it because it's actually a, a, a perfect passive uh, participle. It means Perfect means that it was given to them, but in reality it's true. So they've always known this to be true. Knowing that a man is not justified, man meaning mankind, anthropos, Nobody is ever justified. Period. End of conversation. Never, never, never. This ne not here is not never, never. Okay? So, a man is not justified. Justified to who? To God. 
That's an important point. They want to be justified to God. They are not justified to God. Nobody is ever justified by God by works of the law. I should stop it right there. Which means that you can't get there from here. You cannot be saved and you cannot live a spiritual life today by the law. It's not possible. Okay? But, with that conjunction of contrast, but through faith in Christ. That's the only way to be justified. For anybody. Ever. Peter, Barnabas, Jews, Abraham, anybody. Adam, Eve, Noah, go on and on. It's the only way. It has never been another way. And we'll get to that final piece down here. He says, even we, and that we as Jews, because he's talking to Jews here, okay? Even we Jews have believed in Christ. You know why they believe in Christ? Because they know they cannot be justified by works of the law. Okay, let's give it a little hint. All you can be with the law is condemned to death. Okay, that's it. There's no righteousness in it, just death. Okay, so that, this is, this is a result of believing in Christ, so that we may be justified by faith. Notice that's not by obedience to the law, but by faith. So that we may be. May being potential is whether you believe by faith and are justified by that belief. Okay? In Christ. And, not only that, what's the end of saying? Not only that, but not by the works of the law. You can't get there from here. That's what it's saying. Since, this is an axiom, by works of the law, no flesh, no man, ever, or woman, anybody, will be justified. No man, not never. That's a double negative. In English, that's a positive. But in Greek, it's an it's a emphasis that no, not ever, 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 ever. That's what that means. Okay? So we have, three, we have four verses here. But this is what this means when you look at it. In reality, it's like every time you go to the law to help yourself, you condemn yourself. Okay? That's what it comes down to. Now, the perfect, par uh, perfect act with participle in this thing means knowing. This is Peter's flaw we talked about last week. We know this. We knew this before. We have always known it, that this will never happen. That we will never, ever, ever be justified by the works of the law. That's what that means. And it's perfect passive, no, perfect active, sorry. So that means that they kept on knowing it. They knew it when they did it. Peter was condemned, as you remember last week when we talked about, because in reality, he tried to do this. Remember? He tried to do this. This is what he, this, this is what he was holding against them. <clears throat> um, now remember, so this is kind of a follow-up on stuff we talked about before, is that codex number 1, 2, and 3 are all included in the Mosaic Law. So the Ten Commandments will never ever make you right with God. They will never make your kid be acceptable. You teach in the Ten Commandments, <clears throat> in reality, that's done in every Sunday school in America. But that child will never be one step closer to God because of it. Zero. How do I know that? That's what that verse says. A man is not justified by the works of the law. Unless you've read Exodus 20, which is where the Ten Commandments are, it is part of the Mosaic Law. It's even shown that in the book of Luke. So in reality, that will not get you anywhere. What you want to do is actually have your child be holy. And there is a part to that, and we'll get that in chapter 3 and talk about it a little bit today. Okay? So the merit of salvation is a human concept. Got that? The merit, this principle here, to be justified by the works of law, is a man concept. How do we know that? What does everybody tell you when, when, you, when you come to an unbeliever? First thing they say, it, it is inbred in us. Is that if I'm just a good guy, God will accept me. And I don't have to be better. I just have to be better than those guys. I'm going to get above that. I'm going to be a little higher on God's scale. So when I get before him, I'll be saying, well, Lord, I did these things. 
I did this, 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 this. I was better than all of them. Surely you have to accept me. I was better. I was a good dad. I was a good husband. I was a hard worker. I didn't call. I didn't kiss. I, I, didn't, I didn't drink. I didn't chase after me you and know, give all the whole list. Surely I deserve it. See, salvation by merit is a human viewpoint. And it is a viewpoint that the Jews had in the law. Remember? Remember what the rich man said? What do I have to do? do? What do I have to do to have eternal life? What do I have to do, 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 do? It's a human concept. It is wrong, and there is no such thing in the Word of God. Zero, zero, zero. So we have an idea where we're at there. The law teaches, teaches us what? We are sinners. That's what it teaches. And, but it cannot save us. Okay? And this is the part that Paul Bunyan is talking about. It tells us, run, 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 but it doesn't give us any way to do that. It's like, run, be good, be good, be righteous, be righteous. But in reality, it provides no way for us to be saved or to be righteous or even to have good standing in God's eyes. It doesn't do it. That's why it is abandoned. Even we Jews had to believe in Christ. Why? Because this couldn't take us there. We knew it. See, that's the hypocrisy. Okay, that's the hypocrisy. In reality, understand this piece right here, which is why we talk about the law and we talk about grace. Is that the faith system, which is one in grace, means I have faith, okay, has no merit to it. It doesn't have any merit to it. It's just faith. It's what I believe. I don't have to be strong. I don't have to be smart. I don't have to be, I don't have to be anything. I don't have to be rich, poor, nothing. My faith is how God instituted faith in Christ because it has no merit to it. It has no merit. It means that, and that's why we can be faith, saved by faith and faith in Christ alone. Okay? Um, now, other systems, I'll just call, just bring these up since I wrote them down. Other man way, way of thinking is called rationalism. That's when you take your ideas and you kind of construct them together to make something. That's a human viewpoint, okay? And empiricism is what you experience. That's what empiricism is. It's all the stuff I, I, I experience. And what happens to us many times is we take those experience, rationalism and empiricism, what we see in the world as experience, and we try to add them to the Word of God, to faith. But guess what? They don't add. They don't add anything to it. They confirm, but they don't add. That makes sense? So sometimes people can sit there and say, yeah, but you don't know how it made me feel. I felt so holy. Having fun here. Um, but in reality, feeling holy does not make you holy. No, I see people all the time, you know, they'd be singing their songs and weeping. And then they would go out the following week after they got out of church, do the exact same things they've always done. You've seen it. You've felt it. I'm not going to say you did it because then I'd be in trouble, right? I'd be judging and I'd be in trouble. But in reality, all of us have experienced that hypocrisy. And that's what the hypocrisy is. Because in reality, feelings don't add to the Word of God. The Word of God is perfectly strong and powerful and true infinitely without any additions. It's what we have. It's what we have faith in. What God has told us. Okay? We are justified by faith in Christ, which means that we are perfectly acceptable to God. What they were trying to get, they couldn't. You can only get there by faith in Christ. You, if you, if you believed in Christ, and I mean, notice I use the past tense. If you believed in Christ, I'm not saying you don't believe in today, but if you believed in at the moment you were saved, you were saved forever. Okay? You're saved forever. And the reason you're saved forever is because it is from God and God himself. Let me help you understand something else too. This is true in salvation and it's true even in, as a Christian. Is God is not impressed with our righteousnesses. We know that from Isaiah 64, 6, right? Your righteousnesses are as filthy rags to me. We know that. <clears throat> but God is impressed with the infinite righteousness that is imputed to us at the moment of salvation. Remember the 33 things we covered? Those 33 things? We, that was in there. And one of the reasons it's important to know is that you cannot, what God is impressed with 
Every day that you're alive and forever after from the moment you're saved, what God is impressed with is his, is his righteousness that is imputed to you from Christ, from faith in Christ. That's it. That's true always. So at your highest moment and as your deepest failure, He loves you and, and He has justified you and you are righteous in His eyes always. Hard to believe, huh? Hard to believe that what we do day to day, no matter how good it is or how bad it is, does not make His love for us or our salvation flex away even a tiny, tiny bit. Now this isn't taught to you in Christianity because this is all faith. This is grace. That's what grace is. Grace means no strings attached. That means when God gives you something, like salvation, which he does, in reality there's no strings attached to it. You believed in it, it's done forever. And it wasn't done by you, it was done by Christ. It was done by God the Father as part of his plan. So it tells you, you cannot lose it. Guess why? You did not earn it. It wasn't yours to take. It was given to you as a gift of grace without, without any strings attached. Zero. Zero, zero, zero. When you die, no matter what your life turns out to be, you're going to think, you're going to think this is a different teacher <laughs> because I'm the one who's always telling you spiritual maturity, spiritual maturity, da da da. And, and, and we'll cover that in chapter three. <laughs> we'll cover a little bit here. But in reality, no matter what happens to you, no matter how bad you come, no matter what stupid things you do between now and the moment that you die, you will be infinitely happy forever with Christ. Period. Now, people don't want to tell you that because they want you to be good. And I want you to be good too. But one is not the other. One is salvation. One is the life that you live. You, by your faith in Christ, that little tiny bit of faith, when you reached out and said, Lord, I, I believe in your son. When you did that, that little tiny mustard seed, that's the example that's used, you were saved forever. You got those 33 things, and it is a done, done deal. You have the righteousness of Christ imputed to you and you will be happy infinitely, infinitely, forever and ever and ever, period. And to end of study. Just kidding. Okay. So what happens is that righteousness that's imputed to you is what you are justified by. It is the righteousness of God that allows, that's imputed to you. You have it. It belongs to you. Okay. In reality, it is the justification that you have with God. You are always approved by Him. Now, does that mean He likes your behavior? No. But it's just like a child, right? If your child's your child, they can do things that really kind of, you know, you know ah, that really hurt. You know, you wish you weren't so stupid, but you're still my kid. That's how it is. Okay? So if you have a human perspective, that's what it is. So let's go to uh, verse 17. Oh, no, let's not go to verse 17. Let's read these verses, too. I put them in there for a reason. So we're going to go to Romans uh, 3.20. And what these verses are, these verses are confirmatory, which means that they confirm what we set up here. And they, and they even gave us more information, because they're actually the book of Romans, which all four of these are from, is written later. So Romans 3.20. Um, uh, Therefore, no one will be declared righteous in God's sight by works of the law. See? Right there, that's what that says, a confirming verse. Rather, through the law, we become conscious of our sin. See, that's what the law was always supposed to do. Guess what? Let me give you an example. A kid comes up to me and I say, okay, what did you do? And he says, this is what I did. Okay, that's really good, but guess what? You did this, you're condemned, you die. Yeah, you're, you're, you're cursed, you're cursed, you're cursed. There's no hope for you. And that's, what the, that's what the Bible does. That's what, they, that's what the law does. The law says... Yeah, look what you did. Look at the, the oh, you, you, you get all these ten things? Oh, sorry, you failed in that one? You failed. Sorry, you're dead. <clears throat> you have no fellowship with God. You don't deserve it. Get out of here. Sounds rough, huh? That's what the law does. Law always was intended to do that. Right? Because what happens is we have people like Paul who sit there and say, but you don't understand. I did 150 of these perfect. I only missed one. Sorry, you're condemned. You're dead and no fellowship with God. That's what the law says. Remember this. When you lose, you'll remember this first. 
it says that when you fail in one, you fail in all. Right? That's what the scripture says. When you fail in one piece of the law, you failed in all of it. Every jot, every tittle, if you even do the smallest amount, you violated the whole law. That's what it says. You know this, you know these verses. Okay? And so the whole purpose of the law was not to save you or to make you righteous. It was to make you understand you need a savior. There's no hope for you. There's no hope for anybody without Christ. None. And that's what it was meant to do. So it says it makes us conscious of our sins. Romans 7.10 Even the Jews knew that they could not get eternal life without it. The law could not do that for them. I found, this is verse 10, I found that the very commandment that was intended to bring life actually brought death. That's what the verse says. But I, but I seek the law to have life and to have a relationship with the Lord and be righteous. But when I read the law, it convicted me and I knew I was condemned. That's what, the, that's what the law was always supposed to do. It was never a way to salvation. It was never a way to a spiritual life. It was never a way to, to make me, God, look at me and go, oh, look at what a great job, Richard. He, he hit them all. It was never meant to do that. It was always meant to make me condemn myself through, the, through my understanding of the Word of God. So I would be able to say no matter how good I was, and many of us are better than others, right? Many of us are, are really, really, really good people. You know, they, they do everything right. They're good, this, it. But reality is that it doesn't help them. You know, in time it helps them. They, they don't have as many problems because the more good things you do, the more good results you have. But it doesn't save them. No, it doesn't. Okay? And that's the whole point. What, it, what, I, what I thought intended to bring life to me brought me death. Um, Romans 6.14, a verse that we quote all the time, or at least the principle. Christians are not under the law. Any part of the law, period, amen, done. The Ten Commandments should never be taught to children. Okay, why? Because we are not under the law. If you teach a child that, they will think if they do these things, they will be holy and acceptable by God. But that's not true. It says right there. Okay? Romans 6, 14. For sin shall no longer be your master, because you are not under the law, but under grace. Remember? No strings attached. That's what grace is. Romans 3, 28. This is an axiom of God and is always true. For we maintain that a person is justified before God by faith apart from, apart from means nothing to do with the works of the law. So let's throw the law out like they were supposed to do up here. So let's go to verse, uh, Galatians 17. Um, this is, like I said, this is a Jewish point of view. You have to understand who is talking here. Okay? This argument is straight to them and that's the context. If you take this any other way, it's going to mess you up. See? It says, but if, and this is if is the first class condition. First class condition means if, and it is true. Okay? It, it, it's an affirmative. So, but if, and it is true, while seeking to be justified in Christ, we Jews, uh, ourselves, these Jews, ourselves, have also been found sinners. Wow. So they're justified in Christ, but when they pursued it, they found themselves to be sinners, just like the Gentiles. Okay, we'll get to this in a minute. But they became sinners. This is sinners in the sense of, of being a Jew. Okay? <clears throat> the sin they're talking about here is that they did not follow the law. That's what they did, okay? That was the sinning. Whenever the Jews looked at the law, when a Jew did not follow the law, they were sinners, okay? When, when, they, when Jews looked at Gentiles because they did not have the law, they were called sinners. See, so that's why he's using this word here, okay? Um, we found ourselves uh, uh, sinners, okay? Is Christ, now this is a question, a hypothetical question. It's a, it's a question of insanity, okay? It's a crazy question. Watch what it says. Is Christ then a minister of sin? Is he a preacher of sin? Now, see, this is the argument. Watch, okay? 
because we, 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 while seeking to be justified in Christ, we ourselves have also been found sinners. Okay? They needed Christ. Right? They couldn't do it that way. They needed Christ because they found themselves to be sinners. Okay? And Christ then says here, says, so does that make Christ, because of this, here, in Christ, because they had to be justified, abandoning the law, like it says up here, do they, does that make Christ the minister of sin? Okay? His answer here is that, may it never be, exclamation point. Okay? May that never be true. That is absurd. And what he's doing here, he's kind of like a guy, when you make an argument, what you want to do is when you want to convict him of something, you, you bring up an absurdity. You bring up, so is Christ the minister of sin? See, everybody says, no, 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 that can't be true. That's ridiculous. Don't even say that. Ah, okay. That's what he's doing there. He is pushing the argument to the point to make them understand that they have to abandon the law, which from a Jewish point makes them sinners. Jewish viewpoint. Okay? They have to. Because the law only condemns. And you have to seek grace, not the law, by faith, not by works, not by merits. That makes sense? Hopefully that makes sense. It is, it is a Jewish viewpoint that we are looking for. Now we're not going to go to the next one. We're going to just kind of go down here for a second and kind of work ourselves through it. Now the word seeking here is a present active participle, which means they keep on seeking. Keep on, keep on, keep on, keep on. And the justification here in Christ is the one we talked about, okay? It is the one that before God. Now, the ministry of sin here is only a saying that he's not really saying this. He's making the point of the argument to cause Peter, Barnabas, and the Jews to back down from the law. You know you can't be saved that way. There's only one way to be saved, and it's just like those Gentile sinners over there. Okay? That's, he's poking them. He's poking them hard. Okay, um, the ministry of sin is that grace leads to abandonment of the law. Got that? You have to abandon the law. One, it can't save you. One, it can't make you spiritual. It can't do that. Now, the absurdity of that is that this rubbish got included in the church, and is still in the church, which is why we still teach children about the Mosaic Law. Why we ourselves hold ourselves to a standard. You know why? You know why you're saved? You know why I'm saved? Because I had faith in Christ. There's no other reason. Period. Dot. End of conversation. Not because I'm good. Not because I'm better. I'm not better. I'm not good. I don't deserve to be served, saved, and neither do you. Neither has anyone ever, ever, ever. It's grace. Okay? That's the whole point. So Christ is not the author of sin. Okay? And the whole thing says like this. I wrote this down. It's actually from somebody else's piece. But it, it says it better than I could ever say it. It says, what does that make Christ? A lawbreaker? Because when you abandon, from the Jewish point of view, when you abandon the law, you became a lawbreaker. So does that make Jesus a lawbreaker? That's his question here. Okay? Um, it'll, it'll come back... Uh, um, it says, when you go back to the law for justification, you are saying, in effect, that what Christ did on the cross is not enough. Now, that's the whole charge here, <clears throat> is that when Peter went back to the law, he was going back to say, well, you know something? My salvation wasn't enough. And this is their whole argument, right? This is the Jewish argument of the Judaizers, is that faith in Christ is not enough to save you. You have to be circumcised. Oh, and you have to eat the mosaic food. Oh, yeah, yeah, and, and don't hang around with those Gentiles. See? That, what does that tell you? Is that the, the faith of Christ on the cross, in reality, Christ must have been a sinner. Absurdity, right? Because his death on the cross was not enough to save us. We had to go back. To, we had to go back to this. This is, this is the argument that they're trying to put. It's that you have to come back to the law because the efficacious, and that means completed, effectual salvation on the cross was not enough. That's the crime here. That's the crime. In reality, when you look at it backwards, you see the insult of the cross. That's why it's so important. 
The Jewish behavior is an absolute blasphemy of insults to the Word of God and the truth of God. They went back to something that would never save them. And they knew it. Perfect sense. They always knew it. There wasn't a time when they didn't know it. Okay? When you, when you say, because of this abandonment of the law that Christ requires to have faith in him, <clears throat> in reality, you're saying that faith is not enough and that Christ needs help from the outside. And the answer to that question, absolutely not true. Okay? <clears throat> There's no justification in the law. Even the Jews find themselves a sinner. The law condemns them too. The law condemns them. And there is no hope for them. That's why they have to go to grace. If he abandons the law, I mean the Jews, by the Jews, Jewish point of view, therefore Christ becomes the minister of, of sin according to their viewpoint. So let's go on to 18. We're even tired. We got good. Got to the time. Okay, so let's go back up to here where we're at. <clears throat> so we're going to follow this thing. Never, that it never be true. Remember, this is all Jewish viewpoint. And remember what I'm saying here and what he's saying here. Peter, uh, uh, Paul is banging on the table to the church at Antioch, insulting them for something that they already know. He is sitting there. He is revealing their hypocrisy. He is pulling the covers off of them. See, the Gentiles don't know. The Galatians don't know, which is why he uses the Antioch as an example, because it's a Gentile church. They don't know. In reality, they don't know the law. They don't know that viewpoint. As far as they're concerned, they're not good enough. They're not good enough because Peter made it obvious when he walked away from them. And what you're doing must be sinful, and it must be wrong, because in reality, I'm Peter. I'm Barnabas. I'm the other Jews. Yeah, we're Christians. But you get the idea? You get that point? What's going on there? Okay. So, verse 18. For if, and this is, this is the part when he goes to the proof, okay? This verse right here, you have to understand, is not only Jewish viewpoint, is not only a public sermon, he's revealing this, but Peter, this is you. Okay? And Peter knew it. Nobody had to say it. Everybody knew it. Everybody in Antioch knew what happened. Okay? And what he is doing that way. For if, first class edition, means if and you do, I rebuild what I have once destroyed, I prove myself to be a transgressor. Okay, let me unfold that for you. Okay? <clears throat> what I rebuilt was the law. See, I put a little picture here for you. See, well, I, I, I rebuilt the law, even though I once destroyed it. See, when, when, when he came to Antioch, he was in the law. He left the law, and he went to grace, right? He went to eating with them, fellowship with them. They're having great times together. They're having great Christian fellowship. That's what he did. And then when the Judaizers came in right here, he kind of moved away. He went back to the law. So the real question, he says, He's asking them, he says, I became a transgressor. So where did you become a transgressor, Peter? Here or here? Which one? It has to be one of them. You were wrong, but I didn't hear you say so. <coughs> Hypocrites are cowards. And in this case, this is where Peter is. So he's really asking Peter, Peter, which one was wrong? Where were you wrong here, Peter? Here, here or there? Which of the two? Okay. Um, like I said, in reality, the subject of this is Peter. <clears throat> the viewpoint is Jewish. If you try to do anything else with it, you end up with a mess. Legal, legalism, and this is how you can tell, whenever you feel a person is being a hypocrite, legalism is usually what's behind it. You just can't see it. Okay? So legalism always makes you a hypocrite. <clears throat> Peter knew he was wrong when he withdrew from the Gentiles. When he set, uh, when he was set aside by, when he was set aside by God. If you remember in Acts chapter ten, we talked about that last week. <clears throat> in reality, this is a repeal 
of, of the cross that's taking place here. Okay? That's what we're seeing here. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, so that's what's taking place here. That's what Peter's, and that's what he's accusing him. And it's hard for us to see, but in reality, he is showing that Peter is a transgressor either here or here. He is wrong. Okay? Now what he's really doing, he's making a point of this to show that in reality he wants to reveal ultimately this doctrine right here in verse 20. Okay? So let's go to verse 19. I think we have a little time for it. Yeah, we have time for it. <clears throat> for the law, I died. Now that I is Paul talking about him. For the law, but he's still, this is still in the sermon. Everything to the quotation, so the quotations go all the way down to here, through 21, to the end of the chapter. <clears throat> he says, for through the law, I died to the law. Okay? He says, let me see, where is it? For through the law, I died to the law, so that I might live for God. Okay? And what he's saying here is that through the law put me in a place where I was condemned and there was no hope for me, so that when I became saved, I died to the law that I might live. He had to die to the law in order to be saved. Up there. Hopefully you follow that. He had to die to the law. He had to get out of the law, as it says up here, in order to be saved. This is the principle he's bringing forward on this one. So that I might live to God. Now this part here is really interesting. There's going to be great verses here. The live part is eternal life. This is the life of God that we have. When it says that we live, once you became saved, when you become saved, you have the potential, okay? Remember that word, potential, to live to God. You are now free. You are now free to. You don't, you're not demanded from it. You're requested. Remember, like I said, I bid you to fly. That part there. <clears throat> so let's look at these verses here. Because in reality, in order to live, let's read this backwards, to God, he had to die to the law. That's the way to look at it. You cannot get there any other way. Um, the law kills us, and because it kills us and condemns us because we fail to meet it, we have no fellowship with God. We have none. Okay, so that's, that's, that's the Jewish point of view. <clears throat> now again, like I said, the Gentiles aren't confused on the issue because they don't know the Mosaic Law. This argument is meant for the Jews specifically to dismantle it. But in doing so, it should help us as believers to abandon the legalism. To understand that not only are we, not, we are saved by grace, but the Christian life is lived by grace. It's a choice. It's a freedom. Okay? And that in reality, if we don't achieve that great spiritual life that we should have, that God has given to us, it is given to us in grace. We have just rejected it. Will we be saved? Absolutely. Hope you didn't miss that part. <laughs> okay? The law always kills us. That's the whole point. The things that come out of this verse are, 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 are this. Is that <clears throat> as soon as you put yourself under the law, you become spiritually dead, which means that you have no fellowship with God because the law condemns, right? We've read that over and over again. Once you're dead, that means that you understand that you're spiritually dead, it's talking about here, you need a Savior. See, that's what made me look for Christ, is that once I understood there was no hope for me, that's when I needed a Savior. That's the part that a person acknowledges in their brain, is that is that. There's no hope for me. I'm screwed. I'm going to hell. I, I, there's no hope without Christ. And that's when you acknowledge it. That's when you acknowledge it at the bottom. And you realize there's no way to get there from here. I can't be good. I can't. There's nothing I can do other than have faith in Christ. Lord, I believe. That's what that happens right there. You seek a Savior. And faith in Christ causes regeneration, right? Become saved. And that is where you get life, eternal life. The law can, cannot save you, the law cannot make you righteous, and the law cannot justify you. Now, because the law 
Because the law dies to us, we have fellowship with the Lord. This is just this principle up here. Okay? It's not, a, it's not, we're not on it anymore. We had to abandon it. We had to give it up because there is no way to be saved in being good. No way to be saved obeying the law. Okay? We had to abandon it to have fellowship with God. Now, this does not mean we are lawless. I'm going to put this in This does not mean we are lawless people. It means that we are holy people. It means that we love the divine establishments of God. Okay? In reality, we have, we have, um, we still love the government. We love our laws. We know that they're evil sometimes. But that does not mean we abandon them because we are called by God, by God, to obey our government, to do these rules and principles. We love those rules. But those rules will not save us. Okay? That's the whole point. We need to know that we have to have a Savior in order to be saved. And that Savior is Jesus Christ. <clears throat> We've got a couple minutes. We'll just read these verses here. And then we'll be... Verse 19. Romans 7, 4. It says, so, so my brothers and sisters, you also died to the law. No, I keep repeating that. I keep repeating it to help you understand that it's said so specifically and so many times it should never even come across your lips. Okay? Nor should it come across the church's lips. Okay? It says, through the body of Christ. It says, you died to the law through the body of Christ. That means when Christ was crucified on the cross, that is the way that you made it through. Okay? That you might belong to another. Who's the another? Christ. And it says, to him. To him who, raised, uh, who was raised from the dead in order that we might bear fruit for God. Now, that's the only way we were saved, is that in reality, through Him. And note that here's, here's a little piece of Christianity stuck in here, and I don't mean it that way, I mean about the Christian life. In reality, it says, in order that we may bear fruit for God. What does that mean? That means that after we're saved, our purpose becomes bearing fruit for God. That's the part we tell you about all the time. That's our purpose. That's why we're still here. Okay? That's where we're still. That is our purpose, to bear fruit. And that's spiritual maturity. <clears throat> Romans uh, 6, 14. Uh, this is the repeat of the other one. We are not under the law. I'll just end it there. But under grace. We are not under rules. We are under grace. Okay? That grace that we means that we can choose yes and we can choose no, and we don't lose our salvation. But the question is, did what Christ did for us on the cross and all the things that we have in eternity, which is glory and blessing and happiness and riches beyond understanding, does that obligate us as Christians to live to glorify our Savior? And each person has to answer that. I'll tell you what the Bible says. I'll tell you what I say. I'll tell you what we say we know is true. It's absolutely, unequivocally, yes, it does obligate you. But if you do not do that, that is between you and God. Okay? That's called grace. See? Grace still shows up. Ephesians 2, 8, 9, the part that we covered before, is that <clears throat> we are under grace and grace alone. Salvation and life come from that grace of salvation. Okay? And this is Ephesians 2, 8, 9. For if, for if, <clears throat> for it is by grace you have been saved through faith. Not a second way. And this is not from yourself. Listen to that. That's why you can't lose it. You didn't give it to yourself. You can't lose your salvation. If you believed in Christ at any moment, in reality, you were saved at that moment, and you're saved forever. Perfect tense. Saved at the moment you believe, saved for eternity. Okay? For it is a gift of God. You accepted that gift when you became saved. You were regenerated, and that's a gift from God. You can't give it up. You can't surrender it. You can't get it off yourself. You're saved. And so is every believer who is saved at any time. Even the thief on the cross who did nothing after that. Verse 9, not by works, so that no one can boast. See, that's what they were doing here. Why did the Jews want that? They wanted to boast. 
We're holier than you Gentiles. See, that's where it comes from. All legalism has hypocrisy attached to it. We'll come back to... Is that 19? Yeah, we'll come back to 20, my advice, very favorite verse. And that's a good thing because there's quite a bit to do here. And then we'll finish this up next week. And we'll take a poke into um, Galatians chapter 3, which is, is about spiritual salvation. I mean, it's about, about spiritual life. But guess what? Grace. Grace again. Let's pray. Dear gracious Heavenly Father, Lord, I thank you for your great love for us. I pray help us to make these things very clear in our hearts and our minds, that we will not be snagged by them, by another teacher, by anybody else, because you've given us the verses here. We know what they are. It is grace and grace alone. That is your opportunity to allow us to live eternally and to be free to serve you. We ask these things in our Savior's name, who provided them. Amen.